Welcome to the This Is Horror Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilson, and today, back on the show, back in co-hosting duties, it's Bob Pastorella. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. How are you doing today? Oh, just getting coffeeed up, ready to roll. Oh, yeah. So, today, we're going to be interviewing Barbie Wilde, whose collection, Voices of the Damned, you reviewed on the This Is Horror website. Yes, sir. That's an outstanding collection. Outstanding. And do you have Barbie's bio? Yes, I do. Uh, Barbie Wilde is best known as the female Cenobite in Clive Barker's cult horror classic Hellbound Hellraiser 2. She's a founding member of the mime dance music group Shock, which supported such artists as Gary Newman, Ultravox, Depeche Mode, Adam and the Ants in the 1980s. Wilde's dark crime novel, The Venus Complex, was published by Comet Press in November 2012. Fangoria has called Wilde one of the finest purveyors of erotically charged horror fiction around. And that is Barbie. All right. Yeah, you really managed to condense that bio. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, shall we get her on the show? Yes, let's do it. And now for a horror interview. So, Barbie, firstly, thank you very much for coming on the This Is Horror podcast. Well, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to to talk to you guys. I want to start off with if we could find out where and when you first developed an interest in horror. Well, I think that... It's all to do. I always blame my big brother. Um, When we were growing up, he would always make me watch the creature feature with him every Saturday because we grew up in Canada in the United States. And there was always a scary movie on Saturday afternoon. And I didn't particularly want to watch them, but he didn't want to watch them by himself. So I was introduced to 50s sci-fi and horror like Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Day the Earth Stood Still, Invaders from Mars. Now, a lot of the themes of these, especially the first and the third, film was paranoia it was you can't trust your parents because they could put like a pod under your bed or uh, that's an alien pod or, or if you go down into the basement you could get drilled by you know aliens that your parents have been drilled by and so you can't trust them and all that sort of stuff so that set in early uh, not only a sense of paranoia which well, my favorite quote from the film Strange Days is, paranoia is just reality on a finer scale. Um, but uh, also just, you know, this stuff is probably a very early age. And also my reading taste, my dad loved science fiction. So I was reading science fiction when most little girls were reading Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm or whatever the heck they were reading when I was a kid and, and Sherlock Holmes stories. So I loved crime as well. So it was a strange mixture of influences, the sort of black and white horror, sci-fi, and also films like The Innocence, The Haunting. They were all on TV when I was a kid. So They just made a big impression on me. And I probably watched them when I was a little bit too young. So that set into uh, my my sort of overactive imagination problem. Um, But the stuff fascinated me. So it was kind of, you know, it was a positive thing and um, a thing that sort of caused me concern as a young person, thinking aliens were going to come and take me half of me wanted them to take me away because where I lived was so incredibly boring but the other half were were sort of worried about all that kind of thing so that's where the (laughs) the interest you know that's where the interest began is is stealing my dad's sci-fi books and reading them and um, the black and whites on on the on tv and we know that from there you played the female Cenobite <laughs> in Hellraiser, and of course that you went to uh, study drama in New York. Um, but were you kind of writing at that time as well? So from a young age, were you creating these stories, perhaps to 
make the mundane reality of where you were living a little bit more possible. well I, all the all the places i lived in the united states were incredibly boring and small townish and so i started writing i think the first thing i wrote was this you know very imaginative cinemagraphic story about paul revere which i was very proud to stand up in front of class and read when i was about 12 and i always loved writing and I was very much encouraged by my parents to keep writing. And um, I went to university in New York State, and then I, I found it very difficult to, I don't know why, I was having problems uh, staying, because I just wanted to get out in the world and do stuff. And so I had a chance to do a program in London, and I was able to stay because of, you know, my, my parentage and grandparentage and stuff. I was able to stay in London, <clears throat> studied mime, and but all that time, you know, when you're an actress, you're also trying to write stuff for yourself as well. So there was always that theme of, of writing. And when acting left me behind in the mid third when I was 35 ish or something, I started writing a, a dominatrix novel about a dead dominatrix and you know the noir esque kind of thing because I was always interested in in crime primarily. Um, and I was doing that while I was being a casting director. Because uh, that was the next phase of my eclectic career I moved into. So, um, which I didn't like very much. But no, I've always been writing, always been working out ideas. And uh, so that was always a theme along with the, the acting and stuff. I mean, to be honest, you know, when I was offered the audition at Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, I almost didn't go because. I, the first film scared me so much, and I thought I was going up for the role of the chatterer. And that, that I've told Nico a million times that he scared me. But Pinhead was kind of sexy, but the chatterer was very disturbing. And then somebody said, oh, no, no, it's for another character, another Cenobite. So I, um, I, did, I was persuaded to go. But I think if, if you know, in 1987, when the first film came out, it was considered, you know, the new face of British horror. Everybody went to see it um, just to see what Clive Barker had pulled out of his hat. And it was just the most extraordinary vision. And he invented a new kind of monster. And it's not every day that people can do that. So if it hadn't been for a conversation, then you wouldn't be kind of touted as the female Cenobite. Yes, no. Well, my friend Jeff said, oh, go on, Bobby, you know, because um, uh, it was a bee, yeah, they, he considered it a bee movie. Um, you'll be queen of the bees in 20 years or something like that, because I'd done Death Wish 3 before that, all my, the film, and, and Grizzly 2. So all my movies had numbers after the titles. But no, no, it was very much, a, oh, well, yes, I'll go and do it. And I think also because I was a, classically trained to mime artist um that that's another reason why they they wanted to see me because the the received wisdom at the time was that mime artists were better uh, more patient under the makeup and costume process you know very heavy prosthetic makeups and stuff because i had auditioned for Greystoke. do you remember Greystoke with um christopher lambert as tarzan <laughs> Yeah, I auditioned. Yeah, I auditioned for one of the apes because uh, they got a bunch of mime artists in. So we had to sort of, you know, watch a whole bunch of Jane Goodall films and mm -hmm. and pretend to be apes for two weeks in a workshop. We didn't even get paid. I don't know what the heck I was thinking of, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, but you know, so it was very much the idea that that mime artists are better perhaps a little bit better uh, placed to take that kind of, you know, sitting in a chair for four hours. Unfortunately, they chose poorly when it came to me because I was like, oh, my God, I'm so tired. And why can't I talk? And can I get up and move around? No, Barbie, you have to stay in the chair. You have to finish your makeup. So it was, um, I mean, they didn't choose poorly, you know, because I love doing the part and stuff like that. But I was not a very patient person, I think under the makeup process because it is very long yeah i can only imagine <laughs> <laughs> although geez you know poor old john hurt how it was like 10 hours to do his elephant man something horrendous like that for his elephant man makeup and and ken cranham's makeup was six hours i think for the channard uh cenobite 
Yeah, I mean, so, in 10 hours, you can fly from the UK to Japan. I know, exactly. <laughs> As I'm sure most, John Hurt was probably wishing that he had been doing instead of being sitting there in a chair. He said, I think he said in an interview that he fell asleep. He would just go yeah. to sleep, which I think is quite astonishing. Well, I mean, I suppose it's a way to maximize your productivity, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. It's like, right, well... I'll sleep if I'm going to be here for 10 hours. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So, um, no, but, it, you know, <laughs> but luckily, I mean, we were very lucky because everybody, you know, all the makeup artists were wonderful, the image animation guys and um, the, uh, you know, all my fellow actors were utterly adorable, keeping our spirits up, you know, and Simon and Nico and uh, the, the, the Cenobites kind of stuck together you know, um, because we had so much makeup to be done and they were just always keeping, a, you know, telling jokes and Simon used to do the can-can on occasion in his butterball costume, which is something to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Maybe it's something we can see. It'll kind of emerge on YouTube. <laughs> it's on YouTube. It's oh, on man. YouTube. If you, if you go, if you put in memories of image animation hellbound you'll see clips because i think jeff portis had a video a early video camera and he was videoing us all um i was singing cabaret songs from cabaret to the makeup artists to their enormous puzzlement and nico was always laughing and doug was telling jokes but it was simon doing the can can is the one i remember the most but it's all there everything is there on youtube all right, well, I'll include links to it in the show notes. <laughs> okay. Well, right. if you want me to, to pack, get, I think it's pretty easy to find them, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, yeah. if I have any difficulties tracking them down, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, okay. But I, I did want to ask you about how you feel about being known as the female Cenobite, because obviously, even though it was a major part of your career as you said your career has been so eclectic you've done so much more than that and obviously in 2012 you released the venus complex you've just released your new short story collection voices of the damned um has your success within fiction changed your perception is is being known as the female cenobite something you want to escape or embrace well i think it, it is a funny thing isn't it i mean i i remember talking oh god i can never remember his name dirk benedict and um i was at a convention and i met him always had a bit of a crush on him because of Battlestar Galactica and everything. <laughs> and he said, you know, I've done more than just the A-team and Battlestar Director. I'm, you know, I've done all these things. And I said, I know, but isn't it wonderful that people do know you for this? And that's the way I look at it. I go to conventions every year and people say, you scared me to death when I was a kid or whatever. And I think I, part of me just goes, but I'm just a little blonde person but the other part goes wow i was this i played this powerful character in part of clive barker's mythos and that's fantastic and it's it has been you know i mean it's funny because the venus complex it's about a serial killer so i suppose it is considered horror it has been reviewed mostly by horror uh, outlets uh but as far as i was concerned it was you know pretty much a pure you know serial killer thriller kind of mind of a psychological sort of thriller um not horror but you know if i hadn't been in hellbound maybe i wouldn't have gotten any views at all so you have to say this is wonderful i'm happy to be best known for this but, but also because it's being part of something that was involved with clive barker who's you know an artist and a writer and a filmmaker that i really really admire so that's wonderful and you know as the the cover he was very kind to allow me to use three of his artworks for the book because each story is illustrated by an artwork or an illustration. And he's on the his artwork, um, She Waits, is on the cover, which is wonderful. So it's really it's a lovely connection. And I'll always be happy for that. Will I be happy if people are, know me more for the old, my own wor worlds that I create and the, the words that I spew out? Of course, yeah, because this is something that I've created. If I'm best known for both wonderful best of both worlds um so I'm, I'm i'm not worried about oh i'll 
must be known as the female Cenobite because there's plenty of people in the world who love me just because I said my group supported Gary Newman at Wembley in the 80s, you know. So I get a lot of people who are are um, interested in, in the sort of early 80s blue-haired Barbie rather than the bald Barbie with a rather sort of dubious wound in her throat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, it's... it's um, uh, I, I think that it's... It, you just, like I said, I've had an eclectic career. People pick up on the things that, that I've done. So... If they appreciate it, if they like my writing, that's absolutely wonderful. If they love my performance in the film, that's great. You know, I also taught Sooty how to be a robot. You know, this glove puppet. You probably, Bob, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about, but there's this famous glove puppet kid show called Sooty in the UK, and I was on it. And a lot of people know me just for that. So it's just thrilling to be known for something. I think is the the best way of putting it. Do you know Sooty Bob? I don't know. Did it reach the U.S.? <laughs> no, I, I, the only no, I've, I've never heard of it. Uh, but I was familiar with uh, the Gary Newman and uh, Depeche Mode stuff. Uh, being a fan of, of that music, growing up with that music, so uh, and you know, still still a fan of the groups and everything, and. You know, one of my favorite things to do is like watch old videos and stuff like that. And I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen Barbie and you know, I've seen you in the Ultravox video. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's you got to have those connections like that. And, you know, I always believe that you should have uh, a lot of irons in the fire. It's good. It's, it's, good it's well, I was always of the opinion that, you know, <laughs> Because I, uh, you know, some people will just say, oh, I only want to do stage acting or I only want to do this. Most actors, when they're pressed, say, I was offered this job and I did it. You know, that's how it works, really. Because, you know, there, there are about 80 percent of actors in any one country are probably out of work at any one time. You know, mm -hmm. so if you get, if you, you know, offered a commercial or you're offered the city show or you're offered a chance to dance on the Mo Kerman Y show or you're offered a chance to support Gary Newman at Wembley, if you're in a group or something, you just say, yeah, sure, that sounds fantastic. You know, it's very few times that you get to the point, like if you're Benedict Cumberbatch or something, you go, oh, no, I don't think I like this script very much. I'm not going to do it. You know, um, they're, 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 those people at that level, the A-listers are... Um, there aren't that many of them. So that's why my career has been so, A, because I'm very interested in all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, I would say as a performer, my happiest times were with my group Shock and we were touring all over the place. We went to New York. We, we supported Gary. I mean, that was wonderful. I loved that. So that was probably my, my happiest time as a performer. And, and certainly in acting, I think um, doing Hellraiser and all that was the, the highlight. And um, putting out these two books has, again, this been a highlight because they're my own little creations. So it's all it's all highlights in my life. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, no. Well, it's it's um, you know one works hard to get these things. It's not just like they just pop out so but it is it is wonderful to have the opportunity that somebody says hey yeah sure i want to put your book out let's illustrate each story with an artwork by people that i've admired for years you know like clive and nick percival and danny sarah you know and all the other wonderful artists involved in in voices of the damned so it's uh it's a dream come true so and I mean, yeah, if we look at the artwork in Voices of the Damned, I mean, Daniel Sarah, Ben <clears throat> Baldwin, Vincent Sammy, these are all people that in the This Is Horror Awards have actually been up for Artist of the Year. I mean, these are really A-list artists within the genre world. Yeah. Um, and in terms of art generally. So, I mean, how did this book come together and what was it that made you kind of present it in an artwork and illustrative format? Well, I had uh, done a couple, because Daniel Sarah had done the cover for um, 
my book, uh, The Venus Complex. I loved his work. And he came to me and said, oh, Barbie, I've got this book out called Veins and Skulls. Would you mind doing a review of it? So I reviewed it, and then I pitched the idea of, of doing a little article about Danny, an interview with Fangoria Magazine, Fangoria Magazine, because I've done a few interviews for them as an interviewer. And they said yes, and so I did that for Danny. And then he came out with another book, and I thought, oh, I'd like to do a review of this too. And then the publisher got in touch with me and said, Barbie, I've just finished reading The Venus Complex. This is last November. And I said, I love your work. I love your books. If you have any ideas you want to just, you know, have published by short, scary tales publications, let me know. And I just came right back and said, I'd love to do an illustrated collection of my short horror stories. And that's where it all started. And we got Danny on board straight away uh, because he knew him, obviously, and I knew him. And then <clears throat> I thought, oh, um, what about asking Clive? And Clive said yes, and he, he said he, I could use any of the artworks that I liked in this particular thing, and so I chose three I did, for two for stories and one for the cover. And then I thought, who do I love Next, and there's Nick Percival, all his stuff he did for the Hellraiser Boom comics. And he said, yeah, I just emailed him, and he came right back and said, love to do it. So I just, I contacted some of the artists myself, like Tara and Nick. Steve McGuinness I'd already met at Horrorama in um, Toronto, so I knew I had a personal connection with him. Eric Gross, we've been working together on creating a box for a female centibite already uh, for the Silesian Pandora key. And I had been sort of co-designing this puzzle box uh, or Pandora, as we like to call them. So, um, and then uh, Paul Fry of SST uh, suggested Ben and Vincent. So that's everybody, isn't it? <laughs> I don't want to leave anybody out. Clive, Vincent, Steve, Ben, Tara, Eric, Danny. Yeah, I think that, I, that's I named a lot. Them. Yeah. <laughs> no, good, good, good. Because oh, I love them all. <laughs> I love each one of those artworks, and they're all so different, and they're all so beautiful. Um, except maybe Polyp isn't beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> How could Polyp be beautiful? But it is completely disgustingly gory and and perfect. So they're beautifully all beautifully grotesque. Grotesque. Yes. Thank you. Beautifully grotesque. Beautifully grotesque, yes. As is, you know, Nick Percival's Zulu zombie, the train conductor on the train. I mean, it's just like, oh, whoa, that's so organic. Ooh, <laughs> wonderful. So uh, so that was, that was the idea, and we worked on it. It was, you know, kind of a bit of a nightmare getting all these people together and, uh, you know, giving them stories and which story do you want. And it was a real kind of a bit of an organizational huge project but it all came together in the end um i think quite beautifully it's a little jewel of horror that's why i like to think of it because each one of the stories has got such a beautiful bit of art to accompany it and um and it's out now <laughs> and it's uh, described as a visceral and erotic horror fiction collection which i think it's pretty apt to describe kind of your <laughs> style generally. Yes. Um, what, what do you think is the relationship between horror and erotica? Well, because it's all to do with humans, isn't it? <laughs> That's the way I look at it. We're all these mucky, you know, creatures that, you know, we're all thinking about sex, even if some of us don't want to admit it. And... Um, you know, I'm fascinated by humans and human psychology, and humans are a violent lot. I mean, I, one of my favorite lines is, I think that the really scary monsters in Hellraiser 1 and 2 are Julia and Frank, you know, the human monsters. The Cenobites are just, you know, they are kind of got this kind of purity thing of their purpose and what they do and blah, blah, blah. But, oh, my God, Frank and Julia are really kind of, you wouldn't want to meet them in a dark alley. And um, so I think that, that that's the thing I like to explore is um, the, the sort of how deep and dark you can get into the human psyche. And it's all to do with, you know, feelings and we're all kind of, we're all pulsating 
blood and tissue and sexual thoughts and, you know, all these things. So that's what I like to explore. Um, and it's, it's uh, I don't know where this stuff comes from, if you really want the honest answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did this one, oh, I think it was Gaia, you know, the, the woman who's afraid of home invaders. And I finished the story and I thought, you know, this ending doesn't work. I have to go back and make it even more, you know, whatever. But it's, it is, um, I, it, I don't set out to say, oh, something really is going to, some erotic thing is going to happen, blah, blah, blah. It's just that I create the characters and they scamper off and I'm just following them. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you hopefully have some kind of narrative arc to, to you know, tack them onto. But this stuff just pops out from some deep recess of my mind. And um, and if it makes sense for the story, then I put it in. It didn't make any sense to have anything erotic to do in polyp, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> no. it kind of is a sort of, no, no, you don't want to go there. You know, there's nothing there. It never even occurred to me. You know, an American mutant, you know, there's no sort of eroticism in that. Um, it's, it's, but, um, you know, every time I read my stories, I often burst out laughing, thinking, where did this come from? But it probably just is this sort of simmering little soup of all these influences I had, like I said, when I was a kid. And I remember all these things very, very vividly, how I felt when I was watching, you know, alien or something like that and you just think right but one of the things that does fascinate me is that then a lot of these you know modern films about serial killers are about there isn't any kind of true erotic sort of feel to it um i think one of the only ones that had some little touch of erotica to it was under the skin you know the scarlett johansson film oh, yeah. that had a that had a sort of very fever dream weird feel to it and of course there are some things that you know like the old hammer films i thought were quite erotic in their own way but um you know it's, it's not something i plan on let's just say that <laughs> but it has become my sort of style which is sort of ironic well i remember when i first read the venus complex i thought it was one of the most graphic and <laughs> kind of no holds bar serial killer novels that I've read and I've read a lot of serial killer novels. Um, well, well I, I think that the thing is I was very you know my um, my uh, one of my inspirations was I had a friend of mine who sadly passed away who was a the, one of the top dominatrixes in New York and she had a degree in human sexuality and she's trying to get a degree in forensic psychology and stuff and she said one of her greatest um uh, fantasies something for her it was to sleep with a serial killer and I just went whoa you know but I did a lot of research I read some of the writings of serial killers for the book I talked to forensic psychologists and policemen and stuff like that and I had read a lot I love reading you know Thomas Harris I, you know all these kind of things I love reading and then I thought but you know I've never read anything that really explored their sexual mindscape They're, most of them are men so they're going to be thinking about sex, no matter how much one likes to think, oh, no, it's all about power and it's about this and it's about that. There, there will be some sort of element of sexuality in their thinking and how they treat their victims or their you know, partners or whatever. And so that's what I chose to explore on that. And, um, you know, and writing from the male viewpoint you know, not from sort of a third person. That was very challenging as well. So I had to get into the mind of a man and see women from his viewpoint. And of course, he's a misogynist, or and he wants to kill women too. So that was that was challenging. Oh yeah, I think he, he's a character that <laughs> it can be difficult to relate to. But then sometimes he'll come out with things, and you'll think. Yeah, I completely agree with that. <laughs> not, I think that. Not the misogyny for our listeners. No, <laughs> no. I think in a funny way, he does admire women. You know, it's just that he he has problems approaching them. But no, I mean, I 
I'm, I would absolutely point out that the opinions of my serial killer, of course, have absolutely nothing to do with me. <laughs> but the, this, you always have to have that kind of misnomer. But, you know, he, I did observe the world through his eyes, if you like. It's almost like creating a character as an actor. And, um, you know, he, he saw the absurdity. And one of the, fi- you know, getting feedback from people who've read the book is that, oh, I really agree with Michael Friday and what he says about this, that, and the other. And I go, really? Because I thought this stuff would be kind of, you know, controversial or make people angry or something. And <laughs> I got people go, oh, well, entry, you know, number whatever it is. That's, that's really, you know, I agree with that one, you know. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, and that's, it's kind of nice, but it's also, it's kind of, you know, it's very interesting that a lot of his opinions are popular because he's so politically incorrect. And I think, I think that's another thing that I, I, I feel passionately about because people say, oh, do you edit your work before blah, blah, blah. I never self-edit. And if I'm writing a viewpoint from a serial killer who obviously only got you know, a few sandwiches short of a picnic, I can't edit what he thinks or says. And it's the same as if I'm writing a story about a vampire or, a, you know, a, a mutant or anything. It's just, it just pops out. I'll edit it afterwards if I feel it's necessary. But I love the idea that you, you know, he's, he doesn't have any sort of impulse control because of his car accident, Michael, in the Venus complex. So he's, he's totally and politically incorrect. He says what he thinks. He's sort of like Sophia in the Golden Girls. Do you remember the Golden Girls, the TV? Oh, I do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's she had a stroke or something, and so she'd just say whatever she wanted to say. Michael doesn't say these things, he just writes them down. <laughs> but it is that feeling of not having, you know, no holds barred. He's free to say whatever he wants. And I think that's what people admire about him. And that's what I seek with all my characters in one way, shape, or form. It's that they must be free to express whatever sick, twisted things are, are in their their being so when you submitted it to your editor at comic press was there anything where your editor said oh actually i think we might have to kind of tone this down or i'm not quite sure how this will be received i mean i I know from having read some other comic press titles and in particular the one that's springing to mind is scala by bc furtney that that they're pretty good in terms of what they will <laughs> let go uncensored. I mean, they're, she, they're not uh, one that you kind of think of as being a restrained publisher. <laughs> no, no. they uh, Cheryl of Comet didn't say uh, anything about the content. We worked together. And so, but I had worked very much, because this book had been around for a while, to be honest. And so I worked it to make it as contemporary and <clears throat> snappy as possible because I had a lot of political stuff in there that I ended up getting rid of um, and it's still full of fairly political you know comment about society and stuff um, but no she didn't say a thing I was a bit surprised I was a bit disappointed actually but you know no it's all great you know we love it so <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. There was no sort of, oh, I don't know about that, or, you know, so um, <clears throat> at all. It was very just complete utter support. And I have to say, it's the same same with Paul. There was never any artistic questioning of, oh, are you sure you want the the, the character to do that? I think maybe sometimes you know the big publishers might might be more. Um, concerned about that kind of thing. Uh, you know, in, in, SST is like comedy, independent press. But there was, you know, he, he sort of went, oh, you know, there were questions about formatting and questions about, you know, so, oh, should we, is it that right? Is that grammatically correct or, you know, whatever. Although I'm a bit of a grammar queen, so that's not a big problem for me. But, you know, there were always questions about that, but never any sort of artistic editorial questions from either of my publishers. And I, I was actually on a literary panel with Ramsey Campbell, and we were talking about editors. And he said that is, you know, that's why he actually sometimes likes working with independent press presses because he can do whatever he wants. He hasn't got somebody going, oh, I don't think that's going to be commercial. Oh, you know, this, that, the other. He's got enormous freedom. <clears throat> so I think that's, uh, 
that's you know the, you know I had to do I did a huge amount of editing on all the stories just to make sure that they fit together well because they're all written at different times you know the first stories in 2009 sister Celise my female Cenobite story the last story I wrote was the Silesian rebellion which is the third part of the trilogy and Valeska had been written a, you know a few years ago but I had to turn it into a uh, short story because it, it started out life as a novel so you know the, I had but I had to sort of edit them so they made more sense as a collection a little bit but artistically there was just enormous support and no finger waggling at all it was quite wonderful no i know that when me and bob were talking before we got you on the call that bob wanted to go into a little bit more detail about voices of the damned and the voice there and your influences so Bob, if I hand the sofa down. Right, I mean, re reading the book, there's obviously a, a vein of, of Clive Barker influence there, but, I mean, obviously you've read other people than him. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where, you know, we know we got your, your film inspirations and, uh, you know, things like that. But who, other than Clive, I mean, who, what other horror writers or writers in general do, do you admire? Do you feel influenced by people that inspire you? I, I think that the, the thing for me, what I love about Clive's work is his style. I love his work too. Um, you know, I've, uh, but it to me is, it, I like work myself that is muscular, that is, uh, you know, it, it descriptive but not overly, not flowery. Uh, it has humor in it and is sexy. Now that's Clive. I mean, you look at his stuff. The Hellbound Heart to me is is an example of a perfect bit of, of novella writing. You know, it's, it's absolutely magical and weave world I love. I think with other writers, of course, I've read a lot of Stephen King, Peter Strobe, um, uh, American Psycho uh, by Brett Easton Ellis. Um, Shirley Jackson, I love. I would say one of my favorite writers is uh, Patricia Highsmith because she has all the qualities that Clive has. She wrote Strangers on a Train, notoriously in The Talented Mr. Ripley. Um, and when she was like 25, it's so irritating. <laughs> She's a genius. But um, her stuff is really, it's it's short it's it's packed with description and yet you, you bash through hooks they're they just create these visual images and they're sexy and they're funny find it very important to always have a little bit of sense of humor and it. so and the other two people that i would say are huge influences are Dashiell hammett and um Raymond chandler because i love crime you see that's my you know and again they have that sort of short sharp shock you know, kind of writing. Hemingway is the same, although he's not so popular because everyone thinks he's misogynistic, but I think he's still a genius as a writer. So these are my my favorites. I love Paul's writing. Um, he, he was the one who got, he and Marie O'Regan were the ones who got me started writing horror because when they uh, approached me and said, we want to write a story for the Hearts Anthology, which was everything would be based on Clive's mythology for Razor. That's why I got started. I said, listen, I only really write crime. I don't write horror. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, dear, that's changed. <laughs> but they, they encouraged me. And so that's why that came. And then somebody approached me at a convention and said, listen, I'd love to design a box around Sister Celise. Can you write the story? So I wrote the Celestian Pandoric. And then <clears throat> foolishly, at the end of that story, I said, oh, it caused the Celestian Rebellion of the Female Cenobite. So I had to write that story. So those three stories in the anthology were sort of something that was were coaxed for me. It wasn't like I decided to choose to to write these stories. They were, you know, I was asked to write them. Um, so that's that's you know, my, I, I would say, but that's definitely it was Clive's influence and all these writers' influences on their style and how I admire how they tackle certain subjects. And uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of another. Oh, Bram Stoker. My first horror novel was um, Dracula in a journal. And my first novel was a journal style. So that's another huge influence. 
and uh, Rosemary's Baby was another one that I read when I was far too young. Uh, another stolen from my dad. Um, so these are these are the things that have made an influence on me, have, have influenced me. Well, it's interesting to say that you started off writing crime. Uh, it, it's it's like the exact opposite for me. I started off writing horror, and then I, I went to crime fiction because I, I, I I liked writing about villains better than well, you know the square jawed, save the world hero. Uh, that's well, always so always boring. when I was re- when, yeah, when I was reading even when I was a little kid I was reading Sherlock Holmes and I loved Sherlock Holmes but Moriarty fascinated me. I made up a backstory for him so it would explain his <laughs> crimes. You know, <laughs> so it's to me it's always been the the, the psychology behind the character that fascinates me. So it doesn't really matter what genre you're in. You could be in horror or crime or, you know, whatever. Um, of course, in criminals, they're kind of more interesting than, you know, somebody who works in a factory. I'm sorry, factory person, but, you know, because they're, they're, they're beyond the norm, aren't they? They're sort of right. flashier, perhaps, or not, depending on how they, they don't want to get caught. But um, no, it's it's always fa- to me because I'm sort of very empathic, and you know I, I consider myself a really nice person. So when I hear about someone who doesn't care, you know, who is a psychopath and he does all these terrible things, to me it's just absolute wow. What's the motivation? Why? 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 And that's why the Venus complex is a why done it, not a who done it. You know, pretty much at the beginning that you're reading the story of the criminal himself. Um, but the, you know, I just wanted to explore why, why, why. To me, that's always been the question I've never quite gotten the answer to. And actually, one more writer that I find very inspirational, who's passed away, I think, in the last year, was Colin Wilson. Because he wrote a book called The Criminal History of Mankind. Mm-hmm. And boy, is that fascinating. <laughs> it's just all the bad people who have shaped our world from the beginning. And it's just, it's, and he has a huge chapter about serial killers, of course, uh, but also rulers, generals, you know, politicians. They're all in there. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So, yeah, Colin's another... work is incredible. He wrote the, uh, the Outsider, I believe, yes. yeah. and uh, and also Space Vampires, which was made into <laughs> one of my favorite movies, Life Force. So, <laughs> is Life it Force. one of your favorite movies? We oh, went yeah. to see it, and it was a, a friend of ours' husband was in it, and oh, I don't think actually I don't think I knew Peter then, Peter Firth, and he looked so miserable in that film because I think he was a bit. Of, what am I doing in this film? But I loved the novel. I wasn't sure about the movie, to be perfectly honest. But, um, uh, you know, but I haven't seen it since it's come out, actually. Maybe I should give it another. (laughs) Maybe I should give it another try. I mean, it came out in the 80s, didn't it? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, to me, you know, most people call it a cult classic. I don't think it's a cult classic. I think it's just a, a, it's a under appreciated gem of a horror film right. uh you know and then you know if you talk to me you know people that my, like my friends that don't read and things like that you know and we talk about movies and stuff and of course everyone says oh that movie where the girl's in it she's like naked the whole movie i'm like yeah. there's a lot more just remember that film. bit <laughs> there's a lot more to the film than there's just that you know but that is a highlight Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I basically read most of Colin. I think I've read 17 of his books, Colin Wilson's books. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm familiar. I've read Space Vampires and I enjoyed the novel very much. Um, I have very few memories of Space Vampires so, um, or Life Force. So I'll have to I'll have to check it out and see if I can can watch it again. Um, oh, it's probably been 20 years since I read the book. Uh, yeah. And uh, and probably just as long since I read the outsiders. So I'm definitely going to have to, uh, I need, I need to revisit that. that article. Well, sadly, a lot of his books are out of print, but um, the other one that really made a big impression on me was called the order of the assassin, 
or Order of Assassins. I can't remember. That's when I first read about serial killers because I didn't even know they existed when I was growing up. It was, you know, you didn't have CNN. You didn't have breaking news. You didn't have any of these things, you know, that, that uh, you know, girls disappeared yesterday and what's happened to her, you know, to take weeks for people to sort of, oh, wait, where's, where's Polly? And she, she's gone. You know, it would take weeks for people to realize something bad had happened. And um, so I wasn't really um, very knowledgeable about them. And so I started reading them and going, oh, my God, this is frightening. Another thing to be frightened of in my paranoid world. Um, so but uh, it, it, you know, he's a he's a wonderful writer. So uh, I will revisit that film. And I will revisit his book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, I mean, it's interesting to see that, you know, you, like I said, you, you, you start off writing crime, you have these, you know, horror writer connections, uh, is, you know, from your, in, basically your inspirations, things like that. And it's all kind of, to me, horror and crime kind of go together. You know, I start off writing horror, I go to crime, and now I'm trying to blend the two. So, uh, and I, I think that's that's a probably a deeper connection than most people including writers realize that the two almost go hand in hand yes i think it's about the duality of of human nature yeah well i think what i like to call it is okay there are a few supernatural elements in 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 my story um but when i wrote you know valeska which is you know the the vampire story it's it's, i try to explain it and it's almost how they are these different kind of vampires in a scientific way you know, right. because what fascinates me is is real life horror. You know, serial killers. Uh, people can get mutated by you know um, radiation or any of these things. You know, the guy is a little bit more um, uh, on the fantasy level, um, right. but because something did happen to her or did it, you know, you don't know. But yeah, you know, real life horror is so horrible that you don't almost need to get too supernatural. Because it's all just around us all the time. Exactly. <laughs> um, and they're called humans. Oh, no. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it is fun to write in a supernatural vein when, the you know, the mood strikes. I mean, um, you know, the Sister Celeste stories are, of course, about demons from hell or Cenobites or something. So that was... That's fun. I think the most important thing about writing is that you should always love what you're doing and enjoy it. Um, that's the, you know, oh, I'm going to be exploring this this time. And I think that's really, you know, important. Most writers I know really love what they do. And um, I think that's, you know, important. And if you want to explore a new, new genre, do it. I think that the problem is, is that, you know, those on the outside, you know, either by, who knows, the public or whatever, just go, hey, wow, why is that person writing in a different genre? They're got to, you know, and it's, it's sort of like if you're a pop star and you suddenly want to become a, an actor, you know, especially in England, I have to say, there's a lot of, you know, um, dubiousness. Oh, he thinks he can act now. You know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> So it's, it's, you know, crossing genres can sometimes be perilous, but you just have to follow what you want to do, follow your heart. That's right. Well, I think, Barbie, you're an excellent example of someone who can not only transcend genres, but almost transcend different artistic careers. So for anyone who's saying, you know, you can't sing an act or you can't, write an act or you can't do cabaret in Bangkok and dance in India <laughs> <laughs> you, you are the proof that actually absolutely you can <laughs> well like I said you know a door opens up and you walk through it and it's not like you you know most people can't say, even just afford to say no but you know I look back and I think what a ridiculous career I've had I mean you just <laughs> mentioned you know I was in a Bollywood movie and then doing you know this that and the other but to me it was just an awful lot of fun and how wonderful to be able to to be given the opportunity to do all these things too. I mean, it's it's um, been pretty cool, 
And uh, but I, I mean, one reviewer once said that you know she she writes with such a punk rock irreverence that her previous careers must have had some influence on it, you know. And I think I don't know. Maybe maybe that does have, you know. I have had a, you know, colorful life, and so that probably does have some kind of influence on how I write and what I write and. Uh, so I think they call that being a, being a trailblazer. Oh, bless you. That's very sweet. But, you know, what's been very satisfying, because this, this book has gotten some great voices of the damned and the Venus complex has gotten some wonderful reviews. And a couple of the reviewers have said she just goes to show that you don't have to be a guy to be good at writing horror. And how that's a really wonderful, you know, that's, you know, I felt very chuffed reading that. Because, um, or to even just write visceral horror, or you know, um, uh, that that's that's great. And I think, of course, everybody has an imagination. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you have to write, you know, stories about dolls and pink outfits or something. You know, chiclet. Um, I think we ha should have the freedom to write whatever we damn well please. Oh, I actually used the curse word. <laughs> <laughs> I've been so clean all the way through this interview. <laughs> I think anyone who thinks that to write decent horror or to write visceral horror, you have to be a guy, really needs to just read a hell of a lot more. I mean, there are so many fantastic female authors within genre. I mean, you look at Pat Cadigan, you look at Helen Marshall, who we had on the show recently, and, and Alison and Littlewood. I mean, we could go on and on, really. Yeah, Sarah Pinborough. The ladies bring their A game. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Sarah Pinborough is, is a wonderful writer. And, and the other, you know, in the movie world, you've got people like um, uh, the Saska twins, Saska oh, yeah. sisters, who very kindly wrote the afterword to my book. Um, you know, I, I remember seeing, you know, who are these gals? You know, what hook her in a trunk? And I think I watched it on Christmas. Very apt. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Christmas -y person. And I um, thought, oh, this is a great film. I mean, they made it for like nothing, you know. So we, I'm, I'm eagerly watched American Mary. Wow, what a vision to have. So it's unique how they approach things. And, um, and Jovanka Vukovic as well. And, um, another. Yay, Kanda, another Canadian director. Um, Saska's me. Oh, I'm not a director, but you know, we're all writing and directing. Sorry, I'm writing. They're writing and directing. But um, it's just nice seeing some, you know, people from Canada coming up because it's you no, know, don't hear a lot from the Canadians. Um, so it's it's great seeing that they're, you know, there's a lot of very inspirational lady directors out there, women directors, and um, and writers. Absolutely. It's just, you know, there are a lot of guys doing it too. So we have to uh, just raise our voices up a little bit to get out there. But um, like I said, I've been very chuffed that, that uh, so I've been put on the same playing field, playing level as, as male writers, which is fantastic. Well, you deserve to be there. Oh, thank you. Because I am such a girly girl. <laughs> 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 I am really, you know. I don't like. I said I don't know where this stuff comes from, but hey, um, I'll be bleaching my hair blonde when I'm eighty. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't know if you saw it, but a few years back when Jennifer Lynch wrote and directed Chained with Vincent D'Onofrio, I have a feeling that would really be right up your street. I mean, it, it, it's a serial killer <laughs> uh, film as well, so I think you'd get on with that. What was it called? Chains? Chained. Chained. Oh, I'll have to look that up because I'm a huge Vincent fan. Yeah. I, I mean, think it, he's it's... fab. Of course, he was a serial killer in, um, oh, what was that film called? K um, Cell. Yeah, The Cell. So, yeah, which looked great. Uh, but I think a little bit let down by Jennifer Lopez, actually. She didn't really come across as a child psychologist to me. But, um, no, that that was a sort of fascinating look. into. Wow, the I actually forgot that she was in that movie. 
Well, that's easy to do. <laughs> blows her out of the water, the whole film. And I was like, who yeah. was, I was thinking, was yeah. Julie yeah. Roberts in that movie? Who was the female in the movie? And I couldn't remember. That's how bad she sucked. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but Vincent was good. Oh, yeah. He was great. And, yeah. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I will, I'll look into that because I, I'm such a fan of his. I loved him in, in Law and Order, Criminal Intent. Um, I think he's a wonderful actor. Uh, so I will check that out. Absolutely. Hee <laughs> hee. Although oh, sometimes yeah. they're watching these films, they go, ah, you know. I watched Seven when it came out, and I was still working on the book during that time. Or I had the idea of no no it was before i started the book of course that was in the 1970s the seven wasn't it yeah, yeah. but you know my dominic said oh my god i saw this film seven and she said oh wasn't it marvelous i said oh it put me off serial killers for a year and she went oh no you're the only person i can talk to about serial killers you must get <laughs> interest <laughs> but you know i had to be careful with what i watch god i was i was watching alien 2 in the cinema, and I screamed out loud at one point and knocked my friend's handbag onto the ground. And we're on the floor scrabbling, getting her stuff. And she said, it's okay, Barbie. The aliens just bits of plastic and glue. When I'm in the cinema, I don't see them. They live for me. Well, basically, you know, when I watch a horror movie, things resonate within me a lot deeper than maybe, you know, people who go to see horror movies all the time. And it, it does have a, a, a very visceral connection to me. It's hard to shake off these feelings of dread and horror when I see horror movies because there's so much horror and dread and visceralness inside my head already. <laughs> I wanted to ask what's coming next for you. Right. Well, um, I've got a script to finish. I'm working on the Zulu zombie script. Um, and uh, that's sort of been put on the back burner while I've been getting this collection together. So I have to return to that. There's been uh, several reviews have said Valeska should be novel length expanded. Funnily enough, it started out as a novel. So that that's... It's interesting that since I've been told by reviewers, I have my job ahead of me, but I know that I've, that's, that's there, that's already cooking as a full-length novel. And, um, and people have been asking about a sequel to The Venus Complex. So that's, I don't know about that one. I mean, I, I would love to do that, but it's just like finding some sort of new uh, um, target for his, his anger and stuff. Although God knows there's, there's plenty, of, plenty for Michael to talk about, you know, as far as today's shenanigans in the news and world are concerned. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> so that's three things, um, that, that I'm working on. So, um, that's to look forward to. I just have to, you know, once this sort of opening spurt for the, the promotion of the collection is over, I can go back to doing creative things, which is, uh, of course, the, the important thing to do but promotion is important too because I want to get the work out there so people can see it and hopefully enjoy it or at least say wow what a sick and twisted individual Barbie Wilde is <laughs> <laughs> well I mean either way as long as you get some sort of reaction I mean what you want is either for someone to absolutely love it or to be sickeningly repulsed by it but I guess the kind of nightmare for any writer, for any artist, is to just have a lukewarm reaction. <laughs> exactly. So one of my favorite early reviews for the Venus Complex was was a really bad one. It said, "Sick. This book is is depraved." I only read it because my boyfriend was reading it, and I went, <laughs> "You know, I actually." It's <laughs> and okay, it it dropped down my five star rating a bit. Her her poopy little couple of stars, or whatever. But you know, it's all fine. You know, because there have been enough great reviews of the Venus Complex on Amazon but I included that in the the book <laughs> the beginning because we did an update with reviews in it and it's just like sick exclamation mark because I just thought wow that's that's great that's your job perfect. is done my <laughs> job is done you know so um that's uh you know it's, it's great to get some kind of response from the gut for people but as you say it's the worst is like oh wow this is so mediocre you know you never want that you know, 
It's it's Marmite for me all the way. Bob, you probably don't know what Marmite is. No. Um, it has okay. To do with yeast. I know that. Yes. <laughs> it's it's this <laughs> this. But in what this, context? I don't know. <laughs> okay. No. It's Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. It's a very strong reaction. <laughs> it's. Uh, it's yeast extract, rich in B vitamins, 100% vegetarian. And I put it on my toast every morning because it's so good for you. But a lot of people really find it the most disgusting thing on the planet. So is it when sweet? You, is it sour? Is no, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's salty, delightfully salty. And uh, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it, but in, in the UK, if you say, oh, wow, that was such a Marmite film. It means it, you either love it or you hate it. You, there's no middle ground. So the same so. thing as us saying it's polarizing. <laughs> well, <laughs> that sounds much more intellectual. Yes, it's polarizing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of getting down to the gritty street sort of, oh, wow, that's really, you know, Marmite. But no, it, I suppose, yes, polarizing is that you, you have strong feelings about it regardless. Right. So that's what all one hopes for as a writer is that people have strong feelings. And uh, that's, you know, regardless whether they like it or hate it, at least you've, you've created something in someone rather you've than just a response. Yeah. It, rather than just indifference. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the important thing. And where can our listeners connect with you, Bobby? Okay. I'm on Facebook. You can either go to Barbie Wild Author Actress on Facebook. That's a page. I'm, I'm really sort of bad about that. There's a Voices of the Damned Facebook page. But I think you can just click to follow my posts on Facebook. I mostly post public posts. Um, I don't sort of rant pri privately on Facebook. At Barbie Wild on Twitter. And then there's BarbieWild.com, my website, which I'm also a little lame at um updating but i will be doing an update this week because um i recently got um i can't remember if i mentioned this to you michael in our latest email but um P uh, voices of the damned was actually picked up by publishers weekly for a starred review oh wow no. uh, i didn't mention yeah. it Oh, and the, this impressive collection is a work of beautiful fear, I think is the opening line. And um, it's it. Uh, I was a bit nervous about being picked up for, for review because I thought they didn't particularly like the Hellbound Hearts at all, Publishers Weekly. But they obviously gave it to somebody who liked horror because it was a, a starred review is very prestigious. And again, very unusual for an independently published book. It's so rare. So um, that's been enormous big good news for the book That's and awesome. yeah yeah so pleased about that um so you know just go on and and with wonderful reviews like you guys you know it's it's hopefully build interest in the book so people will be able to uh, uh either enjoy or loathe my work yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i guess that's it it's barbiewild.com at Barbie Wild and Barbie Wild. I think I'm, there are other Barbie Wilds, but you'll see a photograph of me. Yeah. <laughs> My innumerable photographs of me <laughs> so, on Facebook. So uh, um, that's how to, to, to find out what's happening. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been fantastic to speak with you and to learn a little bit more about Voices of the Damned and the process into writing your fiction. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a delight. And um, it is available on Amazon's. Um, at the moment, it says it's temporarily out of stock on Amazon.co.uk. But still order the book because the book is in it has been printed. It is in stock. You can also get it from sstpublications.co.uk. So, um, sorry for the blatant plug. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, this is what it's all about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's been great talking to you guys. You know, good luck with all your, your projects as well. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm sure you'll, you'll see a lot of different things going on at the Sahara. We've just uh, recently 
announced that it's the Horror Awards for this year, and then we've got a few new publications coming out next year as well. So, yeah, we won't be laying dormant, that's for sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much to Barbie Wild for joining us on the This Is Horror podcast. Now, last week we had a competition to win some Alice and Littlewood books. I'm delighted to announce that Thomas Joyce has won the books. If you want to be part of this week's competition, then Barbie Wild has very generously offered a deluxe premium print edition of Voices of the Damned. And not only is she going to give you the deluxe edition, it is going to be signed by Barbie and personalised to the winner. So a fantastic opportunity for one lucky listener. If you want to be in with a chance of winning it, all you have to do is send an email to michael at thisishorror.co.uk Subject line, I want a Barbie Wild book. And if you are drawn out of a hat, or more accurately, picked out of a random number generator on the computer, you will receive that book. Remember to keep up to date with This Is Horror. You can sign up to our newsletter in the right-hand navigation of the This Is Horror website, thisishorror.co.uk. Remember to support the show and leave us a review and a rating on iTunes. And if you're feeling really generous and you have the financial means, please donate to our Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Just donate a dollar every month and you'll really help in terms of the show costs, in terms of just keeping the podcast alive. So, until next time, I've been Michael Wilson. Have a great day. I'm surrounded by enormous building works (laughs) at the moment. So, uh, anyway, so how are you guys? Yeah, yeah, doing pretty well. Um, If if you're surrounded by... (laughs) massive buildings it kind of sounds like maybe this is part of one of your short stories <laughs> <laughs> massive buildings that want to to destroy me yes. yeah although i suppose they'd have to be kind of erotically charged buildings <laughs> i was going to say something else instead of destroy but then i went oh it's yeah. the language rules in this podcast <laughs> no no i mean there, there are no language rules. <laughs> that's right oh, fine. <laughs>